Well, good morning, church. It's wonderful to see you all here this morning. Uh, today we're going to be celebrating the scriptures. Uh, we want to sing about the scriptures and hear from the Word of God. And also, we're going to be talking about the scripture today. And it's good to see everyone. So let's please stand as I read a passage from Luke chapter 24. This passage is uh, Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with his two disciples. And my desire is that what happened to them as they heard the word of God is what would happen to us today, beginning from verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they argued, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them and gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. My desire for all of us is that as we hear the word of Christ, as we sing about it, that our hearts would burn within us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful morning. As we even just read, we celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate the one who is risen, who conquered sin and death. And this morning, we want to sing about you, Jesus. You are worthy of all honor and praise and glory and majesty and dominion. We ask that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things about yourself, that we see your beauty and your glory, that you would incline our hearts to your testimonies. They may be inclined to another place this morning. Would you incline our hearts to hear your word and to see Christ? Would you satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love, and would you unite our heart that we may walk in fear of you? We pray these things in Jesus' name for his glory and for our joy. Amen. to hear you 
Jesus Christ, come renewing our faith, changing our lives with your words of life. Good morning, church. Um, we want to introduce a new song. We went to a conference last week. And we want to introduce it to you. I just want to read um, the third verse. Mighty God in mortal flesh, forsaken by a traitor's kiss, the curse of sin and centuries did pierce the lowly prince of peace, lifted high the sinless men, crucified the spotless lamb, buried by the sin sons of man, but he was rescued by the Father's hand to reign as king forever to reign as king forever, reign as king forever. This song strongly sings about the whole gospel from, from Christ coming down and to the cross and even to the end when he comes again, um, when he shall reign as our um, eternal God. So we'll sing the first verse once. God, the uncreated one, the author of salvation, who wrote the laws of space and time, and fashion was to his design. God, the uncreated one, the author of salvation who wrote the laws of space and time and fashion was to his design the one who made your host revere hung the stars like chandeliers numbered every grain of sand knows the heart of every man he is king forever he is king forever he is king forevermore fortress and our strength, the rock on which we can depend, just in his majesty, his power and authority, unshaken by the schemes of man, never changing great I am. Rise and kingdoms fall. He is faithful through it all. Crown him king forever. Crown him king forever. Crown him king forevermore. God in mortal flesh, taken by a traitor's kiss, the curse of sin and centuries, depicts the lonely prince of peace. Oh, if 
exalted high, the sinless man, crucified the spotless lamb, buried by the sons of men, but he was rescued by the Father's hand, to reign as king forever. Eternal God of grace, we crown you with the highest praise. Heaven shouts and saints adore your holy, holy, holy Lord. What joy in everlasting life, all is love and faith is sight. Justice rules and praises rise at the name of Jesus Christ, King of Kings forever, King of Kings forever, King of Kings forever more time. King of Kings forever, King of Kings forever. short passage from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors, declare me innocent from hidden faults? Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you. If you have your flyer, you may grab it and follow along as I share some announcements with you this morning. This coming fall, in a couple weeks, we're going to be starting a new series after everyone comes back from Camp United, which will be this weekend. It's going to be called, it. This is Your Church, Own It. Once again, this is Your Church, Own It. We're going to be talking about important topics in the Christian church, like communion, like uh, discipleship, uh, like uh, membership and uh, leadership, tithing, whatever topic is related to the church we're going to be talking about. And the goal is for us not only to have knowledge about the scriptures, but understand how the truth is lived out in real life in the church body of Jesus Christ. Um, there is going to be Camp United as you follow with me on this flyer. As you notice, there's some new colors here. New colors means a new beginning to something. We're having starting a new series and just the new quarters beginning this fall, so we're back in full action. Summer's coming to a close, and so we're going to be having classes starting up again, uh, fellowship groups, our monthly men's and ladies' breakfast, and so stay tuned. Maybe in the next few weeks we'll get a calendar that, we'll, that you'll get with all the dates and events all the way till January. Um, we have a very interesting and great announcement about the Women's Bible Study, which is starting on September 10th. Uh, we want the vision of our church is for women to be also equipped in studying the scriptures well. Um, not only uh, to, you know, sometimes the emphasis is on training men and training men. We want to train women as well as much as we train men. And so our desire is that through this Bible study that Olga is going to be leading, uh, that you ladies will be encouraged and even given the tools of how to study the Bible by yourselves. Now, if you're a mother, this is great because you're raising a, a new generation. You're often home with the children. Um, you can instill in them a lot of great truths from the Word of God. Um, it really works in, in any area of life 
affecting families and society. So we're going to be going through the book of First Peter, uh, section by section. Also, we have uh, communion is going to be moved back. Usually we have it the first Sunday, but it's not going to be next Sunday because of Labor Day weekend. It's going to be the following Sunday, which is on the 8th, so jot that down. And uh, one last um, announcement regarding parking. Uh, if you are planning to stay at church uh, feel for, for both services, feel free to park in a parking lot. If you are not going to be staying for the second service, uh, try to leave by like 1045 or a little earlier or park on the street if you want to stay later so that people who are elderly or people who have families can park inside the parking lot um, so it'll be easier for them so they're not in the bustling road. Now, do we have the uh, video for Right Now Media by any chance? For the announcements? Okay, no problem. Uh, right now, media is still live. Next week, we'll have a video. It's a little two-minute kind of trailer of uh, the different things that right now media does, and I just wanted to show you a trailer from the book of Judges. Now, uh, if uh, I talked with the right now media people, they called me, and they said, you sent out an email to 150 people, and only 30 people signed up. Okay, so there's a lot more room. If you have not yet signed up for Right Now Media, you can do that. Now, another thing is that some of you have logged in, but you're completely lost because there's like thousands of series and Bible studies and topics, right? So you can thank me later, but I will be working on a list tailored for our church that I would think has these series or Bible studies that are beneficial to us as a church today. So you can go and check that out. It will be probably live tomorrow evening and you can log in and you'll see Mission Bible Church, and then you'll, have, you'll see things that are recommended right there, and you can start watching those. If you want to listen before then, you should start with Matt Chandler's Psalm 119, 119 series, or the Book of Judges by J.D. Greer. Um, all right, that's it for the announcements. Now's the time to just greet one another. Um, not with a holy kiss, but just say hello. All right.
2020. If you may uh, please find your seat. Uh, we want to sing a song right before the word. We hear the word of God. Please, let's please stand together as we sing this song. My desire is we sing it meditatively as we think upon seeing Christ this day. Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord, as we come to to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail. Let the truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace will stand on your promises and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us speak oh lord till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory You may be seated. So about a couple months ago, I decided to go on vacation with our family, and it was a wonderful trip. As we were flying back from the wonderful country of Mexico, there's a uh, there's all the directions as people are talking in the front, and you know, when you sit down on the plane, they uh, tell you, well, here is your life vest, and then if uh, we lose oxygen, the thing's gonna pop down, you put your mask on like this, and you're like, okay, whatever, I'm gonna just turn on my movie, I'm just gonna start watching it, or I'm gonna just be talking to my friend, because you know that's probably not going to happen. So here we are flying, and as we're flying, all of a sudden the plane goes, and then it does it again, and it keeps going up and down, and I'm thinking to myself, where is this little dot speck in the middle of the sky at 35,000 feet? And all of a sudden, 
That which the flight attendant was talking about is starting to raise back into my mind. What did she say? How do you put it on? What if something happens? Where are my kids sitting? How do I help them? Where is that life? Is it under the seat, on top of the seat? It's because what initially happened is that I wasn't listening. I thought that it wasn't really that important what they were saying. Well, because what are the chances that something's really going to happen? Well, this morning I want to talk to you about a very important topic, which is about listening. If you don't yet have a flyer, Nikolai can pass one out to you. We have the outline on the back of the flyer. And the title of the message is, Listen Up. Oftentimes Jesus says, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you. What is he saying? He's saying, Listen Up. In the Proverbs, we often hear the same thing. Listen and be attentive to the words that I say. Listen to the words of wisdom. This is important, and I, and I titled it The Life-Giving Responsibility of Listening. You see, there's a responsibility that we have to listen to God's Word, just as we have a responsibility when we're sitting in that airplane seat, and we are, uh, as a flyer, uh, as a person who's going to fly, we have a responsibility to listen to what's, what should we do if something does happen. Now, why are we talking about this this morning? Well, I want to test you, and you can test yourself. I want to ask you a few questions. What is the key theme of John chapter 13? This was just maybe a month and a half ago. Um, what did you study Sunday night two weeks ago? What book did we study before the Gospel of John? You guys answering those yet? <laughs> So statistically, you're going to forget 80% of what I'm saying to you this morning by Friday. Eight, zero, 80%. And I don't even have to go far and go statistically. I'll give you two life examples. One of them was, not this last December, but the previous December, I invited one of my professors from seminary, Dr. Mike Hannum, and he came to preach, and he said, every church I go to, the first sermon I give is a sermon on love. And I thought, that's wonderful. I've been talking about love. He's going to just compliment it. Talk about love. So he talks about love, and you guys remember the chicken with the head cut off, right? That's kind of how it looks like when you're very active, but you don't have love. Uh, you guys remember that? Uh, and so the sermon finished, and I'm talking to people in the back and throughout the week, and everyone's like, man, that was an amazing sermon. That sermon on love was awesome. Like, I didn't know those things about love. It really convicted me. And I'm just sitting there like, I've been talking about love for three months, sprinkled here, here and there. What does love look like? How are you supposed to, you know, to grow in love? And all of a sudden, you have someone else come in, right? Um, and he's preaching about love. Now, that's not to say that, like, I'm sad about it, you know. That's just the normal life. Uh, another example I have is from a group that we had on Wednesday night. We'll talk a little bit about the preacher and the uh, word of God itself and where we should at times emphasize. So another example is Wednesday night, we come together. And I asked people, let's, uh, let's just share about, you know, Sunday sermon. So we're sitting there around the circle after we sang songs and prayed. All right, uh, who has something to share? Um, well, yeah, the sermon was from the Bible. It was, it was a good one. Uh, yeah, it was convicting. <laughs> it just, ought to, like, well, well, tell me, what, what stood out to you? I don't know. Which, uh, which <laughs> chapter was it? What was, what was the passage? Well, I know we're in, uh, you know, let's just say First Peter, right? But that's just the, the reality. And after uh, someone said, well, Dennis, why are you so on top of this, right? Why do you care so much that people remember, right, what God is saying and what you're preaching? And I, was, and I was telling them, like, the reason why it's sometimes, like, I'm irritable or might be even a little bit upset, which I'm not a, as much anymore, is because what matters to me is that you hear and that you receive the Word of God. Because ultimately, it's not about me who's standing up here. It's this word right here that God is trying to use to change your life. And if you apply it, and if you hear it well, you're going to receive the blessing. You're going to be the Christian that is growing in faith and love and in purity. You're going to be the person that is bearing much fruit for God. And you're going to be a person so satisfied in Jesus that sin has no more appeal anymore in your life. Because I care so much about your spiritual state, that's why I care so much about preaching what I'm going to preach today, which is listen up, the life-giving responsibility of listening well. Because I want you to grow, I want you to flourish through the words that God has here in his word. So why is this important? I'm going to give you three reasons why it's important. You have it in your outline here. And the first one, it is because you are who you are. We are a people 
who live in a broken down house. That is what this world is. It's a broken down house. The windows are broken, the door is broken. I don't need to go far to tell you the laws that are being passed in California today. The sin that is continually permeating. I don't need to tell you about the broken relationships that sometimes we have or the strife that we have between members in the church or maybe the personal sin struggles, but we live in a broken down house. It is because we are who we are. We are broken and God has taken us and he saved us for what purpose? To conform us to the image of his son. To rebuild that which was broken down by sin through Adam and Eve. And so when we come on Sunday, the point of the sermon is to grow your faith. It's to increase your knowledge of God and your relationship with God. Because you come in need of hope, of help, and of healing from in your life. That's the first reason why you should listen well. It is because we are who we are. Second reason, it is because God is who he is. And who is God? God is a God who communicates. God is a God who isn't silent, but he speaks, and he speaks loudly, and he speaks through his word. He spoke to us in many ways. Before, how did God speak to his people, to Israel? It was through the prophets. And then God uh, spoke through his word, the written word, and it says in the last times that God has spoken to us through his son, how does God reveal himself or speak about himself to us? He sends Jesus Christ who is a representation and an exact imprint of God and who he is. And so God is a God who communicates. God is sitting across the table from me. He wants to speak to you and he gave you his words right here. And he wants you to sit down just like you would sit with anyone at a cafe across the table and talk and have a conversation. He wants to talk to you. He wants to talk to you in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. He's a God who communicates. What is he communicating? He's communicating how you can have a blessed life. How can you be a person who is happy, content, satisfied? A person who is a wonderful tool for his kingdom. That's what God is communicating. He's communicating how should family life look like? How should you be a Christian that impacts society? How you should raise your children? God is a God who communicates and that's why we must listen. Third, the reason why this is important, why we must listen up, is because the word is what it is. The word of God is what it is, and therefore it does what it does. We read Psalm 19, verse seven to 14, and it said, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. There's something that the word is, and because it is what it is, it does what it does. Just think about it. The scripture is called a sword. What does the sword do? It pierces to the heart. Sometimes you don't even know the own motives of your own heart, but you hear the word of God preached, and you realize, wow, my motives are skewed. It is a mirror that reveals, James 1. It is milk that's going to nourish you and help you to grow. It's a lamp that shines in the darkness of our hearts. It continues to purify us. It's fire that consumes. It's a hammer that shatters and then builds us up. And so God has given us this tool belt, his word, and it does all these things in our life, a variety of things. And this is why we must listen today, because you are who you are, because God is who he is, a God who communicates, and because the word is what it is. Now, if we truly believe, and I want to ask you, do you believe that the greatest benefit in your life this morning would be hearing the words of Christ, the word of God himself? Do you believe this is the greatest benefit in your life? Or do you believe it's that next level in your career that you're going to reach? or that you're gonna have a few kids and that's gonna be the greatest benefit in your life. Or whatever it is that could be in your mind where you're thinking, well, the greatest thing I need to achieve that's next is right there and you're putting your energy and effort into it. Maybe buying a home. We should be, if uh, it is the greatest benefit, eagerly sitting at the edge of our seat because it teaches us, the word teaches about God. The word teaches us about how to find hope and healing. I want you to think about those times, or a time when you went to a conference, where there was Resolved for the first time, or Shepherds, or maybe you went to the Gospel Coalition, or maybe you went to the Getty Conference, Sing 2019, like we went to this week. I remember the first time I went to a conference, it was 2007, Resolved, and here is John Piper, the man that I've been listening to for a whole year. The man who, in one of his books, had a quote by C.S. Lewis that transformed my life. Second transformation after the Gospel transformation. And here I am listening, I'm at the edge of my seat because I am ready, I'm ready to hear what these pastors and preachers are going to say. Because I believe that at that moment, this was the most important thing that I could hear. I mean, we give a lifetime to having a career, to planning a trip somewhere, to buying a house, 
how much effort and energy do we put into hearing well, hearing well, hearing well? Paul said that this life is passing by, but life with Christ is going to be eternal. Jesus talked about people who build treasures on this, on this earth, and he says this parable, fool. You're a fool that you're treasuring this up because you're going to be gone tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen. James says, don't say today or tomorrow you're going to do such and such a thing because you don't know what your life is going, what's going to happen in your life in the near future. And so I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you um, to take getting ready and preparing and listening to sermons just as seriously as you take schooling, house hunting, your side hustle, hobbies, Bible reading, and prayer that you take just as seriously listening well. And so this is not a sermon, I want to clarify, it's not a sermon you listen to my words well, but it's being more attentive to God's word, being attentive to God's word. John Stott reminds us of this wonderful quote, it's on the front of your flyer. He writes, it is plain throughout scripture that the health of God's people depends on their attentiveness to his word. And simply put, a deaf church is a dead church. So there's two parts in Sunday morning. There's the preaching, which one person does, and then there's the active listening, which everyone who comes here this morning does. Now, I want to look at principles with you, and I have them listed here, principles for listening well. And I want to specifically look at them from Scripture. So I want you to open your Bibles so that you can see these principles with me. The first principle is this, and these are the first two are going to be misconceptions that we have in terms of listening. Misconceptions we have. And so here's the first, first principle from 1 Corinthians. Listening well means trusting more in the power of the word rather than the presentation of the word. Listening well means you're trusting in the power of the word more than the presentation of the word. Have you ever heard this saying, people say this, that you can get something out of any sermon? You can get something out of any sermon. Well, before I used to not believe it. But recently, in the last few years, I've been realizing that it is true. I can get something out of God's word because if the preacher just comes up and reads a few verses, oh, the power of that word is sufficient for us to be changed. And in 1 Corinthians 1, we're going to look at a few verses. Paul is talking about how the foolishness of God, the message of the gospel preached, is actually power. Now, understand that in this time, eloquent speech, uh, or giving speeches was, was something that, that people did. They would have these arguments, and whoever had better speech and better words and a better argument usually won, not even if what they were saying is true. And those people would then get money, right? That's how they'd make a living. Uh, and so Paul is saying, I'm not like those people. I don't come in eloquent and great speech. So let's look at the first one. The messenger that God chooses is weak. Look at verses 26 to 28. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Speaking of salvation, but speaking to also a greater extent, is if you're wondering why sometimes <laughs> the preacher's a little dull, <laughs> a little bit quiet, or a little bit unclear, well, because the weak, it's a weak vessel that God is going to use, so that power belongs to him. So the messenger is weak. What we also see is the method is not impressive. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. Start with verse 3, actually. Chapter 2, 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And here it is. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. They weren't in plausible, lofty speech, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. What he is saying here is that I am a weak vessel so that the powerful word of God, when it is spoken, may get all the glory and not myself. What we also see here is the message itself is powerful. Look at verse 18 of chapter 1. For the word of God, the word of the cross, is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, what is it? It is the power of God. Why does Paul do all of this? Why does he talk about a weak messenger, a method that's not impressive, and a message, though, a message that is powerful? Because in verse 5 of chapter 2, he says, so that, it's a purpose statement, your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
God wants your faith not to rest in the greatness of the preacher or how clearly it is presented, but in the, the pure power of the word of God that is being shared and preached and spoken. I realized in my own life, I'm a creative. I like art. And I like to craft things so that they're like superb and perfect. I like to find the best illustrations, the best introductions. And sometimes I write so much and I start my introduction and by the middle of it, you guys are already tired of listening because it's so long. But I want it to be just so good, but it doesn't work out all the time. But that's who I am. I realize that I'm trying to win you over by my eloquent speech, by my lofty speech, by my just persuasiveness. Well, Paul says he doesn't do that because he wants your faith and I want your faith to rest in the power of God, not in the wisdom of what is being said through me. Now, a side note about the preacher, it doesn't mean that the preacher should be boring. It doesn't mean that he should be hard to understand or hard to follow. No, he should be clear and he should be excited and worshiping God as he is preaching. But it does mean a couple things, that God's power is at work. The message is more powerful than the messenger. And this is what we see from the example of Spurgeon's life. Spurgeon was walking past a little church and it was snowfall very high and he was walking past it and a lame man was preaching and he walks in and the guy is saying, look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth from Isaiah. And he just kept saying that because he didn't know what else to say. And then he pointed at Spurgeon and said, look to Jesus, young man, you look miserable. Just that one verse through this weak preacher and Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, was saved. So you must be prepared to listen, whether it is John Piper who is preaching or whether it is a guy who just graduated seminary two years ago. All right, second misconception that we have is this, is we think that sermons are for knowledge. And so I want to say that listening well is not so much about gaining knowledge of Christ as much as it is about increasing faith in Christ. It's not gaining knowledge of Christ or about Christ, but increasing faith in Christ. Usually when a sermon is completed, we, we rate it. How much new information did you learn? What was interesting? And I've noticed it after I'm preaching. People share that which was new. Oh, I'd never heard that before. That was interesting. That's what they remember because we are, we are aligned to think about what is new and how much knowledge I can gain. We go to conferences and the guy says, open up to Matthew 28. And you're like, well, my pastor preached on it five times. He preaches about it every year, the Great Commission. We should be doing it as a church. I read two books on it. I already heard this before. But the purpose is not knowledge, but faith. Open to Romans 10. Romans 10, verse 17. I want you to see this. Romans 10, chap chapter 10, verse 17. What we find here is the culmination of how are people going to hear the gospel if no one is sent? And in verse 17, it talks about the initial faith, the faith that saves. So faith, belief, which we've been studying through John, comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ or the word that is about Jesus. So we see that faith, how you become a child of God and how you come in, have salvation is from hearing the gospel. The word about Christ is the gospel, what Jesus did. Now, we've also been studying in John that faith increases as people behold or see the glory of Jesus. And so when we are listening, the purpose or the intent is that your faith should grow, that your faith would help you to get through your week at work or with your family, that what is heard will help you to get through your personal sin struggles or your interpersonal conflicts with people, or the things that you hear will build your faith to help you walk in greater obedience to Jesus in the hard places that are to walk. The purpose is not to gain knowledge, but to grow faith. Luke 24, 27, it's the word about Christ, and Luke writes for us, like we read, he began, Jesus, from the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms to interpret everything concerning himself. See, all of scripture is about a person. It's about someone, it's about Jesus. Why is it about Jesus? Why is it about what Jesus did and who Jesus is? Is because when you see Christ, you behold his glory, you're being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Your faith is built. Your faith is built. And so I want you to assess the sermon, not by how much you learned, but how much your faith grew. And in both of these things, we've got to put on different glasses. We've got to look through a different lens of how we listen to sermons because we have been trained and conditioned to listen for knowledge and to listen for a wonderful presentation. We haven't been conditioned 
to really listen for the power of the word and listening at all times, any times, or to think about how is this going to help my faith. I want us to learn to do that together. Now, a third thing, a third principle, is that listening well produces fruit in our spiritual walk. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Don't all flip there together at once. So Nehemiah is after Ezra, and Ezra is after Samuel. So here is Nehemiah chapter 8. Now the context of this is people coming out of exile. They've been exile. They haven't heard the word of God in a while. Look at, look at what happens here. Now this is an unconventional church service. Starting from a verse, uh, let's start from verse 1. Nehemiah 8, 1, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded. So here they're bringing the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. This is where we get our principle why we start church at 845, and it runs with to both services till one. So early morning, and we're not even too biblical yet. Early morning is like the break of dawn, so 6 a.m., 6 a.m. Next week we can start that. So here it is. So they, it's till midday. They're standing there. This is like at least four or five hours. And they were what? At the end of verse 3, all the ears of all the people were attentive. Key word, attentive. They were listening intently. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform and he spoke. Okay, and Ezra blessed the people. Now let's, let's skip to uh, verse, verse 8. They read from the book, uh, from the law of God clearly... And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So they were interpreting, like they're explaining, kind of like what I'm doing. As I'm taking this passage, I'm explaining to you. That's what they were doing. Now look what happens in verse 9. As they preach or speak the word and read it and interpret it, the people started weeping. When they heard, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Why, why did they weep? Because they were convicted. Because they saw themselves as who they really are in the mirror of the word of God. And they were weeping. And then Ezra, Nehemiah said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And they calmed all the people, etc. And it continued. And they went away great rejoicing and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Listening well produces, uh, relates or increases our spiritual walk, produces fruit in our spiritual walk. What is a fruit? At times it's conviction, it's rebuke. At times it's encouragement. We, all of that is what the word of God gives to us. It produces something. And what were they doing? They were listening. And clearly what I want to do is I want to look at verses where people listened and what the reaction was. Now, let's go to the greatest preacher who trumps the prince of preachers. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 with me. Matthew chapter 5, actually chapter 7, we see the end of a wonderful sermon, the, the greatest sermon that was ever preached. This is the sermon, sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus says here, and what Jesus is doing here, is he's actually in one sermon trans, uh, moving upside down the whole Old Testament and showing that it was deeper than that. It was beyond just the 12 commandments. Ten Commandments, that it was about the heart. And so he's emphasizing the heart, and Jesus says in verse 24, hear this, everyone then who hears, my question is, did they not hear? Didn't they hear what Jesus said? There's a difference between let him hear, he who has ears, let him hear. What, what does it mean that you can hear and you cannot hear at the same time? Well, you can just hear with your ears, or you can hear through your ears into your heart. Right? There's a difference whether it penetrates just here in your mind or it penetrates down all the way into your heart and you heard it with your heart. So Jesus says, everyone who has ears, who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. So what is Jesus saying? That listening attentively with your ears into your heart is going to determine whether you're going to stand or fall in your life. 
when hardships and trials come, when the storms of life surround you. But listening well is only the first step. Listening well is only the first step. And so another principle is this. Listening well is the first step to blessing. Joshua 1.8. You don't have to open it. I'll just read it. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. What's going to happen? You'll be prosperous. You're going to have good success. But it begins with hearing. When you read the word of God, when you don't let it depart from your mouth, it means that you're listening to it. But then you have to be meditating on it. Then you have to do it. And then you're going to be blessed. But hearing is the first step. Brothers and sisters, if we miss the hearing, if we don't hear with our hearts, how are we going to apply it? How are we going to meditate on it? What did David say? Your word have I done what? I've hidden it deep down in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that's why he was able to apply it because it was here inside of him. That's what my desire is for all of us, that we listen well. It's the first step to being blessed in our life. And lastly... And let me highlight another reason why this is important. This is extremely important because if you don't listen well, then you're going to apply wrongly. If you don't listen well, you're going to apply wrongly. It's a principle of hermeneutics. You observe, you interpret, you apply. If you don't observe enough, if you don't listen well with your mind and your heart, you're going to leave here and you're going to start applying things which the preacher never said because you didn't understand it clearly. And the last one is listening takes priority over acting. That's in James. Be quick to speak, slow, uh, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now, often we want to act quickly. We should listen quickly, act slowly. This is another thing that adjusts in our lives. So those are principles for listening well. Principles for listening well. Now, you also have an additional sheet. And we're going to go through these fairly quickly. We have an, an additional sheet that I gave you uh, that you can post on your fridge or leave in your Bible that I want you to just keep and meditate on and look at it as you are reading the Bible, listening it to it throughout the week. It's a little paper that says um, how to listen. So you're the responsibility of listening before the sermon, during the sermon, and after the sermon. And I'm going to run these through fairly quickly for the sake of time, but I printed it for you so that you can keep it, so that you can use it. I want to compare listening to scripture with making soup. How many of you made soup here? I've never made soup. I don't know if I want to try making soup. No one's going to eat the soup. I trust my wife to make some soup. Um, listening is like making soup. You got to do, there's some things that you do beforehand. You prep something, right? You dice up the onions, you dice up the carrots, you dice up the potatoes. There's a preparation before you throw it into the water. You turn the water on so that it boils. That's a preparation that happens. If you don't prep, then you got nothing to toss into the, the water. There's a preparation that happens. Imagine if you were cooking and you never prepped. Where would you be? How could you cook? Second thing what you need to do is you, what you do during its cooking is you're stirring it or you're adding ingredients. We're adding salt and pepper and whatever else that you throw in there. Chili sauce, Tabasco. I know how you make your soup. Whatever else, you're, you're, you're stirring it and making it. That's what happens in the middle. And lastly, you just put on a little low simmer and just let it sit there. And you let it simmer. And that's what you do after. It's done. You just kind of put on a low heat and let it sit there. See, this is similar to how we should mm, bring in or let the word of God come into our life. There's a preparation part. There's a part you do during the time of listening of the sermon. And then there's something that you do after. If you do that, the word of God is going to become sweet. It's going to become nourishing in your soul and in your life. If not, then what we're doing over here is we're stopping by McDonald's in the drive-thru. And we are leaving. And we're not getting as much as we should be getting. We're not getting the healthy foods that we should be getting. So this is what you do throughout the week. And one of the simplest things is reading the passage before you come. You start meditating on it early. You let it stew. So we've been going through the Gospel of John. I want to ask you, how many times did you read the chapter before you came to Sunday morning? Right now we're going to be studying a different passage. I will send you out the passages for the next couple months. Feel free to do that. You, you simmer on it, because then when I read it or talk about it, you're like, hey, I read it. I meditated on that verse. Oh, now I'm understanding it maybe even more clearly than I did. Or that was, that was an interesting idea. So that's the first thing you do. You read the passage before you come. Second, pray for God to speak to you. 
So whether this is early in the week or Sunday morning, statistically, 50, less than 50% of worshipers pray for their encounter with the sermons. Less than 50% of you this morning pray for God to speak to you this morning. You just come. There's not this preparation of the heart. I'll give you a couple of verses. Receive with humility the implanted word and long for the pure spiritual milk. Now, if this sermon sounds familiar in certain of these statistics and ideas, it's because I preached it two years ago. I'm going to preach it every year, every August. You're going to hear a sermon about how to receive the word of God. Here's what Michael Faber has says. They did a comparison between one congregation of the people who prayed for service and, um, and another one that didn't. So 35% of the people prayed for the service, and 35% came with high expectation. Another church, he asked, 61% prayed, and 66 came with a high expectation. Why? Because we are adjusting ourselves to hear the word of God on Sunday. We're preparing our minds. We're preparing our hearts for that. Now, what do we ask? We ask God when we're praying for a significant encounter. Maybe it's something that you are seeking to understand, and maybe you're asking God for guidance in your life, and through something that he says from his word, you receive that. The third thing you must be doing is prepping your own heart. This is the parable of the sower. Remember the parable of the sower? What needs more work, the soil or the seed? You tell me, talk to me. What needs more work, the soil or the seed? The soil, right? I, worked at, I grew up on a farm. We had to till the ground before we planted those flowers. We had to add some manure. We had to clear the rocks. What happens if you don't do that? Well, you throw, put in the plant, and then those, uh, those, those thorns, those, those weeds, they get in the way. The rocks are in the way. It doesn't let the flower flourish. So you need to prepare your own heart. You need to clear it of rocks. You need to clear things, right? Maybe there's sin that you need to repent of. Maybe your heart is hardened from sin. And what happens when you pour water on hard soil? It just runs over the top. There's a lot of preparation that comes into, into coming on Sunday. This is what Jesus is saying. One preacher says that we are told men ought not to preach without preparation, but men ought not to hear without preparation. Which do you think needs the most preparation, the sower or the ground? So prep your heart. Fourth, pray for the preacher. Pray for the preacher. Colossians 4, Paul says, pray for us. 2 Timothy 3, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead. Right? Less than 33% of people pray for the pastor or the preparation. This is, this is the reality. You want something out of me or anyone who stands behind a pulpit? You better be praying for us. We're just like you. We live in the same world that you live in. If we're expecting successful sermons, powerful, spirit-filled sermons, then you must be praying for the guy who's going to deliver that sermon. It's not okay that he's just, oh, he's a pastor, he got ordained, or he went to seminary so he knows how to get sermons ready. I am a work of God, just like each one of you here are a work of God, becoming more like Christ. Hearing is a co-laboring kind of work. It's not something that I do, you do as well. And your prayers, they influence by God and his spirit, what I'm going to say on Sunday and how I'm going to say it and with what kind of heart I'm going to say it. The fifth thing, this is stuff that we're still doing before. We're tilling the ground. Very easy. End Saturday night early. Some people here this morning who did not end Saturday night early. They're currently sleeping or they're not feeling well because they didn't get enough sleep for their bodies. And they couldn't get up because they did not end Saturday night early. They ended it at 2 a.m. or 12 a.m. I'm not going to give you a curfew. You know how your body works. But end Saturday night early, the biggest and easiest thing to do. Sunday morning starts Saturday nights. That means that you need to schedule around what's the most important. What's more important? Sitting with your friends, drinking tea, and eating sweets, and talking about most likely things that don't matter in life? <laughs> Or about prepping your body and mind to come on Sunday and hear the powerful word of God preached. Sometimes I'm preaching half you falling asleep and I'm not quiet. <laughs> I'm loud. So you need to schedule your schedule around the church. Do you plan ahead to stay up later? Or do you say, hey, I need to go. Yeah, you're going to be the party pooper and that's fine. Because what matters more to God is your soul than the fun time you're going to have. And you can get up in the morning and have a wonderful time with Jesus. Last time I checked, he's the creator of the universe. He's the one who can sustain and give you joy and everything else that you need. But 
you can also hang out in the evenings as well. So good night rest is huge. Okay, so what do you do before service? We're running out of time. The rest of it's on your stuff. Okay, so <clears throat> what do you do before service? You need to reorient your heart and mind before you come. So when you come, stuff happened in the morning. You woke up late, you need to get gas, you're prepping in the kitchen. Please sit down for 30 seconds to 60 seconds and just pray to God before you start singing. I found myself not prepping my heart. Third song is done and I'm still, my mind is where it was, back at the house or something else I needed to do. I didn't prep my heart. I call you to spend 60 seconds and prepare your heart. Leave the dining area at 8.40. Come sit down, read a psalm, meditate on it. Prepare your heart. All right. The rest of it is in your notes. We'll go over it quickly. I might just give you a couple things. Well, this is what you need to do during the sermon is worship. This is where you praise God. I'm preaching. You can say amen. You can say hallelujah. Multicultural, multi-ethnic church. Okay? We can talk. I enjoy it. I enjoy it when people look at me and they give me a facial reaction. That's a good thing sometimes. You don't have to be just, you know, straight face. So you're worshiping God. I'm, I'm preaching and hearing, you're hearing God's word and you're in your mind and heart. You're, Amen, this is good. This is great. Preach it, brother. Give it to us. Let's hear the word of God. So secondly, you got to think while the sermon is happening. What did the Jews do in Acts 17? They received the word with all eagerness. What are they examining the scriptures? You're examining what I'm saying. You're thinking, is Dennis saying something weird? Fellowship groups? What? I've never seen that in the Bible. How did you find that? Right, the one another's, is that true? Right, the Great Commission, I gotta talk about Jesus to people. Okay, so you gotta think about it. Take notes, I'll, I'll spend time here on taking notes. Take notes, a lot of notes, or little notes, depends how you think and how you work. But I'll tell you this, when I take notes, pencil, paper, you take notes, it helps me remember. And what else does it do? People are students here. You're attentive. You're actively listening. You're not letting your mind drift off when I'm going on a tangent about something because <laughs> you're, you're writing down stuff. But don't take too many notes because you're going to just think about writing everything down. But take enough. What, did, what, was, what was interesting? What was said that could build your faith and give you hope and encourage you? So here is the example. Again, statistically, 85% of the congregation usually takes notes. Second church, only 2% take notes. Church number one that doesn't take notes. 22%, they, couldn't, they, they could only recall the five points by Friday. The second church, over half, 53%, said they could remember the points because they took notes. It's called aggressive listening. You're heightening your concern to what's being said. You have a paper and you're ready. You're active. It's called active listening. Um, one last thing because, and then the last stuff after, you can just read it and we've talked about it before. But I want to, I want to remind you, fight distractions. Fight distractions, people, please. Fight distractions, so we are so easily distracted. You know why? Because of our, our notifications blowing us up on our phone all the time from Facebook and Instagram and we're just used to something dings, something moves and we just, we're looking around. So someone coughs, a kid cries, someone walks down the aisle and this is, this is you guys. <laughs> Whoa, there's a kid walking down an aisle. <laughs> you know? Or like, so, someone is crying. I know, it takes time, maybe you adjust. You hang out with my kids for a week, you'll get used to it. But the point is, fight distractions. What is Satan trying to do as you're listening to the word of God? Talk to me, what is he trying to do? Distract you so you don't hear what is really being said. So that you leave this place not really filled, not really receiving all that God will want you to have. Fight those distractions, please, for your own soul's sake. Because God is speaking to you. He wants to help you and he wants to bless you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to give you hope, help, and healing when you come on Sunday morning. And may that be really true of what is happening here, that you do receive hope, help, and healing. Last three, you, they're in your paper. You retell, you respond, and you, um, you review. Imagine if we were living like this. Imagine if we were really taking the life-given responsibility of listening well. If we listened up, imagine... Imagine how that would affect you as a father, affect you as a mother, affect you as a student. Imagine how it would affect you as a, as a Christian and how it would build your faith, how it would grow your hope in Jesus Christ. Imagine what it would do to our church if we listened well and applied and walking in obedience with Christ. Let's stand right now and I would want to give you a moment to just pray to God within your own hearts and your minds and assess your own life. Do you listen up to what 
is said on Sunday morning to the words of Christ. Father, you have called us to yourself, and you've told us that the aim of our life is to please you, is to honor you with how we live, how we act, how we speak, how we think. You have bought us for yourself with the great price of the blood of your son, Jesus, and you're transforming us and using this wonderful word that you have left for us through which you speak to us and change our life. We want to be better worshipers. We want to be better parents better siblings, we want to become more like Christ, we want to be better people who influence society well, who share the gospel, who are ambassadors of the gospel. There's so many high callings to which you have called us to, so many things which you, you tell us that we should be doing, but it's all rooted in the fact of, of the grace and of the gospel. We can do these things, not be, we do these things not because we have to, we do these things because we get to. I pray that we would understand our responsibility as we hear your word that would be attentive like the people of Israel were, who understand that listening well leads us to a solid rock foundation, listening to the words, and ultimately we get to see Christ. We get to see Christ in all his beauty and all of his glory and all of his majesty, building our faith and granting us great hope. So I pray for your help, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would help us to do this. I thank you for this wonderful morning where we could celebrate, celebrate the resurrection, celebrate your word, celebrate what has been accomplished on the cross for us by Jesus Christ. Let us go from this place filled and rejoicing and humbled because of that. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday morning.